हेलो विकास गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग अंकिता थैंक्स विकास यू हैव स्टार्टेड ऑलरेडी द रिकॉर्डिंग साकेत गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग विकास हाय साकेत गुड मॉर्निंग अंकिता यू आर फ्रॉम एल एंड बॉक्स या गुड मॉर्निंग अंकिता Uh, Sakit will wait for another five minutes, then we can start. I guess. Sure, Ankit. Thanks. हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी गुड मॉर्निंग हाय रुबिना गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग साकेत गुड मॉर्निंग विकास um so there are 13 people that means uh ankita very quickly can you see who is not joined yes yes ruben i'm just uh, giving a reminder to them to join the session uh -huh. Uh, Ravina, uh, this session will be the uh, recorded one, right? Uh, Vikas, can we record it? Yes. Okay. Okay. It's already been recorded, Ravina. Vikas. Okay. Please. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Vishnuke, Shodhika, Nadatri, and Kumar. 
so uh, sakit one small request is um, since we got the um, you know since the training and all happened just last week and um, i'm not sure how many of them have got the software and all so probably okay. today if we don't do a hands on and yeah just that's do... okay as per the plan there is no hands on today it will be more yeah. of a discussion only yeah yeah okay uh, so all of you make sure that you all have the software required software get itim to uh, get the software raise a ticket if you don't have the required software as per uh, ankita's email um, get all that installed and uh, we get be ready with the software by tomorrow so you'll have to get itim's help for that you may have to raise a ticket okay so 15 of us that means there are only 11 participants because not counting trainer ankita myself and vikas there are 11 now there are 12 okay mm -hmm. Ankit, quickly, you can just uh, call those people who are not uh, ping them on Teams or something. Yes, yes, Ravina, on it. Ankit, another five minutes, please. Yeah, sure. and uh, participants please make sure that you join the training at least 10 minutes in advance you keep your teams on it doesn't matter if the trainer is not come but be make sure that you are there for the training at 5 9:30 because this is just a 3 hour training and every uh, minute is important we've already wasted 10 minutes now so you're going to get only 2 hours 15 minutes today so if you want to make the most out of the training please attend on time and every day every day to is a must every day i mean every alternate day monday wednesday and friday you miss one day and you're out of the training because there's no point in continuing there because if you miss on a wednesday then you've had training only on a monday and a friday you're actually missing a lot in between okay so my humble request is those who are uh, Uh, interested in the training please be on time and please come every alternate day for the training we've purposely skipped uh, the saturdays because of your work schedule and all that we wanted to just give you the weekend off okay which is going to stretch this training a little more longer but we don't mind as long as you can benefit uh, much from this training okay so we are 22 of us which makes it a good number so we'll just start um, so good morning everybody and welcome to the dot net uh, uh, training <clears throat> uh, we have sanket uh, saket here uh, as our trainer saket has been associated with quinox uh, 
for the past uh, i think more than 7 to 8 years he's done a lot of dot net trainings for us in the past and that is why sankit is select for the training uh, i've known vikas also from a lot of other institutes and um, you know hope this training is a uh, is a good one and um, hope we'll all benefit from this training we're looking to see some dot net experts come out from this training which we can place you well in the projects as uh, you know as well as uh, you do well in your projects because uh, there is an expectation from you from this uh, training okay uh, your spark for the training is going to be ankita so you reach out to uh, uh, ankita for any um, any issues you have any doubts you have regarding the training okay and um, believe me you are going to enjoy this training with uh, sanket so on that note i'll just let uh, sanket take over thank you very much sanket thank you ravina yeah most welcome sanket okay so good morning everybody good morning good morning Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, so I am Saket Karnak, having experience of more than twenty-four uh, years now, and uh, I actually huh? started as a VB five point zero developer, moved on to VB six, and then since early two thousand, I am working with dot uh, net. Probably that is the reason why I am here. for this training so it all started with the very first beta release of dotnet in year 2000 itself though officially dotnet was released by microsoft in year 2002 uh, that was dotnet 1.0 have worked with all the releases uh, till date uh, since then and uh, not only the dotnet framework which was windows only framework initially i have worked with all the releases of dotnet core platform as well which is totally cross platform and open source right from the beginning when it was released in 2013 14 besides dotnet uh, i work extensively with uh, web development so that all started with classic asp then moving on to asp dotnet then asp dotnet mvc web apis web services and then around 2013 14 i started working with various client side frameworks also libraries as well so it all started with uh, jquery then knockout js backbone js then moving on to angular react currently uh, preparing myself for vue js also and uh, the other areas where i work with a lot is the database technologies mostly the development side not the analytics as such analytics i do work but uh, very less so database development that includes the uh, database creation and programming for databases etc so writing queries writing procedures functions triggers etc is included in that i do work a lot with no sql databases also and then cloud so when microsoft came up with the very first public preview of uh, their cloud microsoft azure i'm working on microsoft azure since then and there are a lot of services which are offered by microsoft azure cloud which include some data services some development services some other services which can be consumed into your applications to provide the modern features within the applications and uh, one of the core area which i work extensively on azure is microsoft azure iot services internet of things basically you must be aware of so again the dev side dealing with the devices and programming the devices uh, using the device data and sending it as telemetry data to cloud and do some analytics on it that's what i do with uh, iot services in azure 
so that is my brief introduction without wasting too much time we will get on to the agenda for today i'll just share my screen please confirm once it is visible yes yes thank you okay so in today's session our focus is going to be mainly on understanding the dotnet fundamentals what dotnet is all about how it actually got introduced why microsoft thought to bring in a new framework and then the architecture of dotnet then the components of dotnet like clr jit cts cls garbage collection etc and then we'll be beginning with the basic c sharp syntax that will be really really basic part of it like we'll be mainly working with the program structure so that starts with hello world program and with the intention of actually understanding what c sharp program looks like at the very basic level what is the structure of it okay so let's start with the very first part of dotnet dotnet framework there are two names into this one two words i would say within this name dotnet framework right now let's first of all understand what is framework anybody would like to contribute i would be more happy if uh, you make this session more interactive you can unmute yourself Uh, collection of multiple functionality to have a rapid development. Okay. So how framework would be different from libraries? Libraries also provide us the collection of many of the functionalities, right? Ready to use. Frameworks can be integrated with multiple technologies also. Okay. Is it true in all the cases? As per I know majority of them, is it true? Now see, I give you one example. If I consider Java as one of the framework, Java SDK as one of the framework, can it be integrated actually with the other technologies also? no idea no yeah that's what the point is so it's not something about the framework being used with other technologies anybody else uh, i guess like multiple languages which supports uh, one framework and we can build an application with uh, like for an example we can develop uh, web applications desktop applications mm -hmm. and so Okay, partially, so partially what you're saying is true about .NET framework. .NET framework supports multiple languages. But again, if I consider Java SDK as the framework, it has got only one language that is Java. I cannot use any other language to work with Java SDK, right? right. Uh, basically, it provides an environment uh, where we can uh... Uh, put our uh, means logic over there uh, to run on uh, Windows and uh, different platforms, Linux and uh, yeah. Like so many things would be contributing to a framework. Framework is complete ecosystem which does provide you the environment to develop the applications, to run the applications, along with multiple library functionality with ready to use features, along with some tools which probably requires some sort of conversion of the code from one language to another language in some cases, or in one format to another format in some other cases. Then other tools like language compilers, maybe some other tools like which convert JSON, XML kind of data to your code. I mean, the classes and all if object oriented environment being used for the programming and probably generating the proxies whenever required. So it's a collection of many things, right? Which is something what we can call as framework. 
understood now we all must be aware of the concept of the co-working spaces what is the advantage of going with a co-working space for a startup company suppose i am an it startup what is what will be the benefit for me if i don't search for an office myself and rather start making use of the co-working space utility anybody Okay, based on the number of seats we have to pay yeah that's one angle apart from that i don't need a civil space to be searched for explicitly i don't need to arrange yeah. chairs tables etc the workstations yeah, yeah, yeah. there are packages where i do get the workstations also right yeah in, in terms of the facility with, like an the video of, net. with an option of probably bring in your own device byod something like that correct then apart from that i don't need to yeah. take care of any other facilities like electricity supply which is uninterrupted i don't need to take care of internet services i don't need to take care of the pantry services tea coffee etc i don't need to provide some uh, separate space for having lunch etc so canteen is what i'm talking about right this yeah, is something yeah, true. whose responsibility is taken care of entirely by the co-working space host or the provider yes if i have any trouble i just need to escalate that to the right person most likely the manager over there some executive must be sitting over there to look after the smooth functioning of that office space right in addition to that if i say that there is a co-working space which help you with setting up the company getting the documentation done right getting the legal things done for you everything in one place it will be much more easier for anyone to actually start the functioning you can immediately start for acquiring the customers or uh, start acquiring the customers right from the day one <coughs> right from the hour one right from the minute one am i right yes 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 and that will be more advantages most likely they will charge something for those services but ultimately that is saving my time also and everyone knows time is also money yes Yes. Ah. Which I can use for more constructive, more productive things. Yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Now, this setup with not only the office space, but with all the other teams already sitting over there, which provide me legal guidance and whatever other guidance that is required. get everything done like uh, uh, getting the pan card for the company getting the tan number all the taxation related uh, formality everything being provided by them they have their C ca team they have their cs team sitting in one place right they have the lawyers also sitting in one place they are providing me everything right at my desk i just need to raise the request for whatever required or maybe i can put the request in a umbrella mode where i go and say that okay i need to start up a company of this nature which will do these things i mean these are the services which i will be offering or i will be a product company for this product they will do everything required for me this is something what we can compare with a framework understood complete ecosystem yes yeah. yeah. to achieve some right. target so that includes languages that uh, languages means language compilers that uh, includes the tools that includes the uh, libraries 
the ready to use functionalities and any other supporting stuff which is required to make the product in our case that will be to develop the software right yeah right so that's framework now what is dotnet dotnet framework by name itself it's it should be clear that it's one more framework from microsoft yes yes now what is dotnet and why dotnet why not some other name net stands for any guess we use this term a lot network 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 internet something right yeah true i mean this is a synonym that is used for either network or internet or related things my net is not working means internet is not working internet ultimately is network only so somehow i can also say that okay my network is not working my net is down yes what it means okay. is dot net has something to do with the networking related things or it is built upon or built for the networking technologies networking based applications what does it mean typically we have the terms like client server or distributed applications those are the applications which fall under this category where we say the application is network oriented or network based am i right yes so the framework was built right from the beginning to target client server and distributed applications mainly it doesn't mean that the other type of standalone applications we cannot build on it we can definitely do that but that was already being taken care of by the older frameworks which microsoft had at that point in time in late 90s and early 2000s visual basic visual c++ visual fox pro were the leading frameworks from microsoft out of that visual basic was the most highly appreciated and adopted framework correct for building the desktop applications but that framework or any other framework during that time was not developed specifically for the client server or distributed apps there are just frameworks which allowed application development targeting mainly the desktop applications the client applications right so if you see vb vb forms allowed us to build typical windows based desktop applications only right so that had a limitation client server uh, applications if i had to develop i need to put my own efforts probably to set up all the networking infrastructure and all in my application so that the client server or distributed behavior can be added a lot of dependency on third party features were there third party technologies were there as well if i am not looking to build everything from scratch i need to look for the third party tooling or third party softwares third party technologies yes or no yes then compatibility becomes a issue if it is like third party stuff being used more than anything else into your process correct yeah yes whatever features whatever facilities they provide only that is what you can do correct yes. so we had limitations okay then even if we put these limitations aside we oversee them point is as the framework was not built specifically for network based applications or client server distributed applications 
it was not optimized for the same. So even if we say that, OK, we will use third party things or we will build our own infrastructure and everything still because of the framework itself not being optimized for that work. A lot of efforts were required from us to make the application. The best in its category. That was not a big challenge, though. Reason was at that point in time, very few businesses became computerized and the number of users used to be less. Number of customers whose data used to be put into the system also was very less. That was just beginning of computing, right? But then in 2000s, when the web based development became the focus, Probably that's where people started thinking that, OK, we need to go beyond what we already have. Because future lies in web. From web, it went on to the smartphones. Smart devices now as on today. And probably in future it might be something else also. Robotics will come into picture as well. Many of the things most likely would be taken care of by the robotics. Correct. Yes. Smart devices are just yes. the stepping stone as of now we can say. So slowly the data is being generated by devices, machines means the next big thing will be robotics. So every five years to 10 years. We see a shift in technology. We see a shift in entire computing world. Data is growing day by day. Number of users are growing day by day. And we require better computing for handling the same. That's how the cloud also got into existence, right? For providing better and scalable infrastructure to support your data, to support your software, to support your logic. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yes, but well, we have seen this all. Right. Those who have not seen probably must have read somewhere, must have. Uh, seen some videos on the same how it was there some 25 years back. Or 50 years back now how it is there as on today. If we go for a simple comparison. We we just get to see how the things have changed. Right, so there was a need which prompted Microsoft to think beyond the frameworks which they already had. Plus they were getting stiff competition from. Java also Java was a kind of a framework which allowed different type of applications to be built using the same platform, same framework, same SDK. It allowed us to create desktop thick client applications. Not only Windows based, but. Cross platform means. We are allowed to build the applications for non Windows systems like Mac or Linux as well. Right then it was already network oriented. It had built in support for client server and distributed. Applications or application development, I would say. Correct then. It was already taking care of the modern needs, not only the modern needs at that point in time, it was future ready also. It was allowing us to build web applications as well. Though the kind of web applications we used to build at that point in time may not be that powerful. Eventually with the requirements being modified or changed over the time, Java also got updates and it became better and better and better to keep up with the market requirements. So Microsoft was already having very, very stiff competition from them. Microsoft didn't realize that till that time because 90% of the computing market was driven by Microsoft Windows, but eventually they saw that in future it may not be the case. In future, 
only windows may not be there which we see today as of now it's not windows driven anymore we have different other systems taking over windows though the windows still has major share but computing is not limited to the typical computer systems anymore your computing is happening from smart devices also which might have some embedded fuzzy logic some devices have android system some devices have ios right different different operating systems have been developed by different manufacturers for their hardwares and all the operating systems basically are providing some sort of computing yes or no so it's not only windows driven it can be anything someone can come up with their own operating system also in coming future right and that makes the difference so they realize that just targeting windows may not be sufficient for us okay now why we are talking about this because this is where we need to understand how dotnet came into existence all of their existing frameworks and technologies at that point in time were windows driven frameworks and technologies windows had even today also there are few things which are actually depending on those old things which uh, windows had uh, in late 90s that is something what we call as component object model one of the platform that microsoft utilized up to great extent to make your code shareable across operating system and applications so instead of saying that okay this component will be for this application only they made a platform which allowed the same component to be used by other applications also as far as it, it was compat compatible with com or component object model understand but again there was a tight tie up between the com and windows com was windows only platform it was based on the corba uh, standard only but it was not open it was pretty much closed and pretty much developed by keeping windows only in the mind because as we discussed at that point in time the market was dominated by windows so there was nothing wrong in that to utilize what was the fact but they realized that future will not be just windows based hence only com based implementations may not work going forward there has to be a full stop for com dependency here onwards for our new upcoming frameworks which will be targeting modern needs that is the full stop in the name dotnet dotnet dot is that full stop which says it's a full stop for com understood everybody yeah yes dot is the full stop for com based com com is component object model right they wanted to move away from that they wanted the components the code to be shareable without any dependency on the operating system so that the entire framework the entire technology stack can be independent of the operating system which lays the foundation for making that entire technology stack the framework to be more cross platform understood yes okay so actually the foundation of dotnet was laid by one intention in mind that microsoft wanted the framework to be 
cross platform to take over the stiff competition being received from java okay but eventually while developing their teams realized that this framework is going to be really really big it will be so big that if we release it for different platforms i mean if we make it cross platform from day one any new feature coming in will require all the implementations to be updated simultaneously and that will delay the process of releasing the new features to all the platforms got my point so they took a step back and decided that let's keep the idea of making the framework cross platform on hold for now we will focus on the platform which is windows only or which will target windows first and we will get it stabilized in terms of features what are uh, modern things are supposed to be added get those added over the next 8 10 years and then we will rethink about going into the complete cross platform implementation for the same you get it yep stabilize the product but that doesn't mean dotnet initially was not cross platform it was because windows also used to come in multiple kind of implementations like windows for devices was there something what we used to call as uh, wince windows compact edition then we had 32 bit windows 64 bit windows then windows came on devices as well like mobile windows phone and windows mobile were there for quite some time right the palm os was based on windows only initial uh, smartphones were basically palm os based and palm os was based on windows right so basically they said that our applications will work on all these platforms all these devices so the idea of moving away from cross platform was not completely put to the rest they kept on evolving by targeting different flavors and versions and variations of windows why windows only because it was their own product they knew the architecture in and out it was easy for them to adapt and evolve around those features yes or no yep so they kept on developing and evolving the dotnet framework and work for making it stabilized this continued till year 2012 and early 2013 different versions were released 1 1.12 then 3 then 3.5 after 3.5 we got dotnet 4 in 2010 even today the base is dotnet 4 only for dotnet framework if i say but then there were some updates and patches being released in between so after dotnet 4 we got dotnet 5 4.6 4.7 4.8 there are minor releases as well like 4.5.1 4.5.2 similarly 4.6.12 then 4.7.1.2 then 4.8 4.8 being the last right no more development going on on that dot net framework anymore by year 2012 end of year 2012 and early 2013 their research started back on getting dot net framework to the cross platform world okay and that's where they started working on dot net core dotnet core a new name was adopted because it was a different dotnet though the development 
or way we used to develop the applications was not getting changed except few minor things the base was the same many of the functionality was the same many of the features were the same but now the intent was to get it onboarded on different other platforms also right so dotnet core again versions different versions we have received till date dotnet 1 uh, dotnet core 1.0 1.1 then we got dotnet 2.0 2.1 2.2 then .NET 3 3.1 dotnet 5 was the next after 3.1 direct 5 why not 4 any idea because that would have conflicted with the existing dotnet framework which was running in 4. series 4.x series eventually the target was to have one single platform which takes care of windows and the other systems as well so instead of maintaining two different branches one for windows and one for other systems they decided that let's merge the two branches into one single framework and that's where they thought that the term dotnet core has to be dropped it has to be just dotnet no dotnet framework no dotnet core it should be called as just dot net which can be used to develop any kind of applications for any system in the world got my point now 3.1 definitely was supposed to be advanced then dotnet 4.8 from dotnet framework with major shift being cross platform Definitely the version was supposed to be changed. So next version was five. They said .NET 5 will be your next. .NET 5 was more of a. I would say laboratory product. Right, what we call as current version these days. Then we got the long term support, which was the stable version of .NET 5 by the name .NET 6. And they maintained the same thing. .NET 7 being the laboratory product. .NET 8 being the finalized stable version of it. Right, so that that's what currently going on. .NET 7, in fact, 7.1, they released as stabilized version long term support as well. Right, but final long term support version of that is going to be .NET 8, which has been re uh, recently released by Microsoft. Got it? That's how .NET has evolved. OK, so put the end to older things which were restricting in a way where the development was supposed to be only for Windows. Change that strategy to allow developers to develop the applications for any system in the world. So it didn't happen overnight or over a couple of months or something. When they decided to step back from the cross platform implementation of .NET in late 90s and early 2000s. That time they didn't dump the entire idea rather whatever development happened till that time on Linux and Mac version of .NET, they released it to open source community. Officially, there was an open source community which was formed. Not by Microsoft. It was supported by Microsoft up to a certain extent, but it was a self driven group. Which named itself as Mono Project. And the Linux and Mac version of .NET continued to be developed. By the name Mono.NET. All these years. Majority of the top developers from this community then collaborated, established a company around 2009-10 by the name called as Xamarin, 
and they started developing the framework for dotnet developers to use dotnet to develop native android and native ios applications so they came up with the platform called the xamarin platform and around 2013 microsoft just acquired that company with that they got all the expertise of providing dotnet to non windows developers they had their own team of engineers already who were doing all the research for the same they collaborated with xamarin team and then came up with dotnet core so that's how dotnet core was born and now the latest version dotnet 8 is what is there in the market officially we still use dotnet 7 till date dotnet 7.1 in fact but yeah dotnet 8 is also currently being adopted by many people many organizations which is totally cross platform so allows us to develop the applications for thick line allows us to develop the applications which are web based service based then the same platform allows us to develop applications for devices also which might include the embedded logic which might include the uh, i mean the applications for the operating systems like android ios etc tv os there are many many smart operating systems these days the same framework we can use to develop the applications for any of these platforms making it very very robust and stronger platform your skill set basically is completely reused what my point and very very stable already it has got all goodness all the efforts of the research work which has been done on dotnet framework to get it stabilized on windows and then the same expertise being put into the cross platform version as well so feature wise it is very very rich many many things are available out of the box so you don't need to develop each and everything right from the scratch you just think what you want most likely there is something in the framework which gives you the foundation which gives you the base you build upon that got my point yes yes yeah. isn't it interesting one framework allowing us to develop the applications of different kind one framework which allows us to develop the applications for different operating systems and operating environments right now let's right. talk about some of the core services of dotnet which actually starts with the core components of dotnet first so just give me a moment i'm opening the whiteboard application okay so when i talk about dotnet framework components let me put that here i hope it is visible yes 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 wait what all things come into dotnet framework anybody who has worked a bit on dotnet already can contribute over here
first of all, different language compilers. In short, can I say languages? Officially, Microsoft comes with four or five languages only, which are built to support .NET framework. What are those languages? Primary languages are C Sharp and VB.NET. VB, uh, VB C Sharp, and one is one of them. F Sharp. Uh, F -sharp, F -sharp was, was added that later is. on. Then there yeah. is something called as Manage C++, and there used to be a language called as JScript.NET, which no more exists and has been replaced by TypeScript, mainly for scripting based applications. Right, so it's not a complete language. I'll not count it, but yes, for our knowledge, we should know it, right? So what are the uh, languages? C sharp, VB.NET, F sharp, Manage C++, and TypeScript. These are official ones from Microsoft. What are the other languages? There are many, many other languages from the open source world which are supported here. Microsoft has released some standards. For the compiler writers. If the compiler writer follow those standards, the language is considered as .NET language. Because .NET has got its own standards. So if you say that, OK, I'm making a language which uh, allows me to write the code that is .NET compatible to be to be .NET compatible, I need to follow the standards of dotnet and then i can say my language is dotnet language right so that's what microsoft has done so we have other languages like pascal dotnet cobol dotnet fortran dotnet the old world languages many of you might not have even heard about the names of these languages but fact is these languages were there for quite some time and were quite popular for different works we do have something called as Iron Python, which is basically the port of Python for .NET framework. Likewise, we have the port of Ruby language also, that is Iron Ruby, and so on. There are many, many such languages. Around 54 plus languages are supported on .NET. Officially plus unofficially. What that mean is 54 plus languages, whichever are supported by .NET mean they all support or follow the standards set by Microsoft for claiming their language to be .NET language or .NET compatible language. Understand? Yes. 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 I'll put the names over here, which are officially supported by Microsoft, C Sharp, VB.NET, Manage C++, And then we have F sharp, which is a functional language, and then we have scripting language that is TypeScript, which is a replacement for JScript, which brings in proper object oriented compiled language features to JavaScript. Right? So many languages. What is the advantage of this? I mean, supporting so many languages. What is the real advantage? Developers from different groups can work together and. Correct. So suppose there is a new project coming in. I am a service based company and uh, for this new project, I need to recruit new team. I am the project manager for it. What will be the biggest challenge for me? I'll recruit the team by uh, sharing the opening in the market. Uh, probably I'll get lots of profiles, lot of interviews. I'll conduct and select the team. The biggest challenge will be the team members may not be from the same background. I mean, they may not be working on the same language, but they do have the domain expertise. They have worked on the similar projects in the past, so I want them to be onboarded. Correct? Language is not the criteria. Framework is not the criteria for me. If I find few people who are already on that language, on that framework, that's added advantage. But I cannot just sit with that requirement, right? 
that will not allow me to get many people or good people on board. Yes or no? So there might yes. be some expert coming from Java development background. There might be someone coming from C++ development background. There might be some Python developer. There might be some Ruby developer. There might be some VB developer. There might be some developer from some other language platform. Maybe worked always on mainframes. Banking system if I'm looking to develop, right? Now mainframe, the core has been developed in COBOL. So there is someone with COBOL background. My challenge is to get them ready on one single platform. Yes or no? Which means I probably need to make them learn a new language, which will take time. Even though you have experience in some programming language, yes, it's true that it will be easy for you to adapt the things because it is only about the syntaxes. Logic building you already have in you, but syntaxes need to be learned which should not be very, very time consuming, but still it will take some time. I need to give them some time to practice on that language as well. Otherwise, within X language, I'll put the code of Y language. Yes or no? Like Java developer coding for VB or VB developer coding for Java. Most likely would end up writing VB syntax in Java or Java syntax in VB at times. Yes or no? Yes. That is a natural instinct, yes. isn't it? We, we have been doing something in some language all the years. We have got rich experience in that and suddenly I'm coding in some different language. So my old things will not go away immediately. Yes or no? I'll realize it. I'll correct it, but it will not go away immediately. It's not like uh, press the button and this is switched off and press the new button and uh, the new thing is switched on. We are not machines. Correct. Yeah, it becomes a challenge. Rather, what if I do is I say Java developer will keep on using Java language for his coding, his or her coding. VB developer will keep on using VB. C++ developer can continue with manage C++ or he has a he or she has a option of getting into C sharp, which is similar to C++ in terms of syntaxes and many other things. 90% it is the same. Then some functional programming background developer can continue with their choice of language or have the option of getting into F sharp, right? Don't you think that will be much more easy and less time consuming for me to get started? My team can get more productive in less time in that way. Maybe a week's time should be enough instead of waiting for a few months. Yes or no? Yes. 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 I just need to make them aware of the new features or the features which they have not used at all in their existing technology. I just need to make them aware of those features. Maybe a common training can happen in that case, right? Where the examples from each languages are there. Concept will be the same, just that the code written should be in different languages. So one base language can be picked up, which is probably similar to most of the other languages for demo purpose. And then the reference to the same example in their native language is also made available so that people can get trained pretty easily. Yes or no? So the turnaround time yes. in this case will be less. And these features can be learned over the time depending on what all features are actually needed in the project. I need not learn all 100% features on day one or uh, week one. I can learn only the critical features to start with in day uh, one or maybe day two. And I can get started with the project development. As and when required, the other features can be learned. So the learning curve in that case will be more flat. Yes or no? Yes. 
So that okay. is something what we call as multiple language support. We do have advantage. This is though not a component as such, but one of the feature of the .NET framework, right? When I say components, it starts from here. The first thing, which is the backbone of .NET, is something what we call as CLR. Let me put this in different color. CLR. What it stands for? Common language runtime. Language runtime. That's right. Okay. Focus has to be on the last part, runtime. What is it? Like to run the Java applications, you need JRE to be installed on the machine where Java program is running. Am I right? JRE, Java Runtime Execution Engine. Yes or no? Yes. To run C++ code on some machine, I need C++ runtime. To run VB code, I need VB runtime. So practically to run the application written in any language, I need its runtime to be available on that machine or device. Without that, it won't run. Correct? So what is runtime basically? Kind of a shell which creates a complete environment support system to make your code understandable by your machine so first by operating system then by hardware correct correct kind of a virtualization system here is what is required because if i'm saying my code is going to be cross platform this system has to be the virtualized one because if it is tied up with the operating system then it won't work on different systems, right? Right. Yes. So that's where CLR comes in for .NET. Now, why common language runtime is the name? Common for different systems, which makes it cross-platform. Then common, the word is there for one more reason. We say common language. So whichever language you choose to code for, C Sharp, VB.NET, Manage C++, F Sharp, TypeScript, Pascal, Python, Ruby, COBOL, Fortran, Java, whichever language you work with, ultimately it is one runtime which will be responsible to understand that code and make it understandable to your operating system and then to your hardware. One single runtime should be responsible. And this is where the standardization is required. Like the output of the compiler should be in a specific format, specific way, so that the CLR can read it and understand it. Yes or no? Yes. 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 CLR itself is subdivided into some components where the first component is something what we call as CLS. Stands for. Common. Common language system. Language specification. Specification, that's right. Sorry. Now what is this? From our discussion, you can guess actually. This is the component which is basically what I'm terming as the standardization. This is the Microsoft standardization for all compiler writers. This specifies all the rules. To be followed by the compiler writers so that your code is .NET code and .NET compatible code. It contains the specification about how the compilation should happen. One of the rules says that OK, the output of your compilation should not be the final executable output. Rather, it should be an intermediate language code that should be generated. What did I say? Intermediate language code. 
So in fact, officially Microsoft has given the name to that intermediate language as Microsoft Intermediate Language till .NET 2.0. This MSIL or Microsoft Intermediate Language was the official name. And since .NET 3.0, precisely not 3.0, it's from 4.0. They changed it or renamed it to CIL, Common Intermediate Language. Understood, which is another official language from Microsoft that can be added over here. Low level language, very near to assembly. Assembly language, I would say. Understood? Yes. We will, we will be looking at the code of IL also, though we will not be coding, but just to get understanding of how IL looks like and to get the proof that the code is not compiled to the native executable, rather it is converted to some intermediate code, will get a glimpse of IL as well. And there you will find that it is very much similar to assembly language. Okay, so that is the most important specification in CLS. CLS has got a subset of its own. Something what we call as CTS. What it stands for? Common type system. Type is data type over here. So we can also call it as common data type system. See, with so many languages being compatible with each other allowing the code to be written in any of them and reusable in any of them. The first challenge will be the data types like. For example, if I talk about C++ old versions. Ain't used to be 16 bit. Now in modern languages like C sharp or Java, int is basically 32 bit. VB.NET doesn't have int data type, rather it has integer. So how integer and int will be compatible? How 16 bit integer will be compatible with 32 bit integer? Don't you think there has to be a standardization in that also? So, this is where we take the LCM of all the data types. We make a pool and take the union of all the data types and we put that into the common type system. <coughs> the common type system names of all the data types. Uh, data types will might be different like 32 bit integer is called as system dot in 32 64 bit integer is called as system dot in 64 date data type is called as system dot date time and so on but ultimately my programmers developers may not be comfortable with these names they might want to or they will be more compatible with Comfortable with the data type names they have been used to. Like int is something which I'm used to. I'll like to go for int. Suppose I'm working in C sharp or say manage C, modern C, and Java. I might be comfortable with int. With VB, I may be comfortable with integer. So that's fine. You can use the names you want or you know. Those are behind the scenes mapped to the common times common type system data types. So during compilation, those all are translated. So even if you have put dim i as integer in VB, it will be taken as dim i as system dot in 32 and IL code. So in, in fact, it, it will not be dim i. It will be the IL code. I mean the translate uh, vb.net code will be translated to il code within which the data type of i will be system dot in 32 automatically this has to be done by your clr sorry the language compiler understood yes 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 yes, yes. Okay, next is 
what we call as just in time compiler as one of the component of CLR. Just in time compiler. On the top, it looks similar to the just in time compiler provided by Java. But honestly speaking, Java doesn't have just in time compiler. It has got interpreter. Because Java code when compiled is converted to byte code and byte code is an interpreted language. More binary in nature, more near to native code. And line by line it needs to be converted and executed immediately. <coughs> in .NET, CLR doesn't do that. CLR compiles the code at once. And that's where we use the proper term just in time compiler. Now just in time compiler comes in three flavors. First is standard JIT. Second is Econo JIT. And the third one is pre GIT. Standard just in time, Econo means economic just in time, and pre JIT means pre just in time compilation. Details of which we will discuss in later part. For now, you can just make a note of these things. Yes. 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 A very, very important tool. Why it is required? Because your code is not native code after we get the output from the language compiler. It is rather IL code. So that needs to be further compiled, isn't it? Another component that we yes. have for CLR is GC. GC stands for garbage, garbage collector. collector. Now, what is garbage in terms of code? Any unused memory oh. is garbage, right? We yes. declare variables, we declare objects. Suddenly, we set the values to null. So what happens to the memory that is allocated to it? Setting null doesn't mean we are releasing the memory. Setting null means the object is not pointing to anything, right? It's not holding the reference of any memory location. But what about the data which is already there in that memory location, which was being pointed by this object earlier? So that becomes the garbage. The memory location occupied. Having some data but not being used anywhere is garbage. And that's what. Where we need the role of garbage collector. Which keeps track of all such. Memory places or memory locations. And clears all this data non required data whenever the application has got the demand for more memory resources. Is it clear? Yes. Next component that we have here is. Metadata. and assemblies. 
what is metadata and assemblies what is metadata here metadata usual definition is data about data but which data it's about your code assembly what is it assembly is the physical compilation unit in dotnet so when you compile your code you get some output as dot exe or dot dll depending on type of the code that you have and this dot dll or dot exe file is what we call as assembly by extension it looks like it is final executable but it's not it still contains il code so when we say that okay execute this the just in time compiler is invoked when we execute it and then the code is translated from IL to machine code and then executed, which makes it cross platform. Do you get it? Yes. Yes. Everybody? Yes. 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 Okay. So I hope all the concepts that we have discussed so far are pretty much clear to everyone. Yes. Great, let's have a 10 minutes break over here. Uh, it's 10.50, we will be resuming at 11 and we'll be looking at .NET application execution cycle first of all. After that, we'll talk about what this uh, just-in-time compiler is and what this assembly is and why it is called as an assembly right and then the last topic for the day will be how garbage collector actually works yeah yes yes right okay yes. so see you okay. at 11. Oh, okay okay
Okay, is everyone back? Shall we proceed? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I hope everyone has noted down all these things. Yes. Great. I'll just clear this. Now let's first of all talk about. The dot net program execution cycle. Look at this image. And tell me what you understand with this. Here to start with what we have. Dot net languages, right? Dot net languages means first of all, they are all CLS compliant languages. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. C sharp. VB dot net. J shop, which is actually Java for dot net. Named as J shop. And other dot net languages. Each language would have its own compiler. C sharp compiler, basically what we know as. C S C. Dot E X E. VB compiler is called as V B C dot E X E. J sharp compiler is Java C dot exe. Another dot net language as it depends on which language it is, right? This is also only for the information. We need not actually know the names until and unless we are not working in that language and we are compiling the code on command line or with some automated script. Make sense? Yes. What is yes. what is the output produced by them? Some TLL or exe file based on the type of application chosen. Right? This is something yes. what we call as assembly also. As we discussed earlier before the break. The physical compilation unit means the physical file that we get after compilation is what we call as assembly. assembly. What assembly contains? IL MSI. code, MSIL, or we also use another term now, modern name is CIL. Right? Yes. And then metadata, which is information about your IL code. Like if there is a class, what is the name of class? What is the visibility of class? Private, public, protected. Then in .NET, we have two more uh, access levels called as internal and protected internal. Then if it is a method, what type of method it is? Public, private, protected, again, access modifiers. What is the name? Are there any parameters? If there are, what are their names? What are their data types? What are their positions? If it is a member variable, whether what is the access 
accessibility of it what is the data type of it now this data member can be variable can be constant and then if there is any property belonging to your type its accessibility its name its data type and then whether it is read only write only or read write all this information goes in metadata so basically your components which are called as assembly in dotnet are self describing so i can also put self describing on the top understand self describing components means what they know what they are and they let the users also know what they are there is no separate registration system or separate database within which the metadata is maintained which was the case in case of com com required all the metadata information or the description about the components to be put into windows registry database that's where while installing your software the windows registry used to be modified is that clear yes yes now what is the output that we got over here is il il then needs to be jit compiled by using one of the type of jit compiler out of the three we discussed earlier before the break standard econo or prejet is it clear yes yes what jet compiler compiler will give you native code which is directly <laughs> understandable by the underlying operating system yes Right. And then it executes. So who takes care of the JIT compilation process and the execution of the native code? CLR. CLR. So there is an extended form of what happens within CLR also. Let's say this is point number one. the expanded view of this portion i am just placing over here inside clr i mean within the instance of clr first it uses one component of clr called as code verifier which checks for the integrity of the code code verifier how how this integrity is checked as per recommendations whatever code you compile should be digitally signed digital signature is always unique until and unless it is not leaked no one can no one else can get it now whenever your application says i am using this component basically within the metadata of its own assembly it maintains a copy of that digital signature if you know encryption encryption uses encryption key and decryption key public and private key right so it is similar thing here the consumer application holds private key whereas the provider application contains the public key if both keys are matched then only the access is granted otherwise the access is blocked there and there itself point is if there is no registration system if component is self describing the hacking will be much more easier i can just create the component with the same name as yours with the same version number as yours and probably on the target machine i can just delete your component file and replace it with mine with a twist my component has got exactly same structure as your same function same methods same classes everything same but the logic is destructive logic it just formats the machine whichever functionality you call 
the machine gets formatted or it introduces some virus isn't it dangerous yes don't you think there has to be a check on this one simple example when you go to office do you get the direct access no no how you get the access right from the main gate main First gate probably i place. card is enough right yes but when yes. you enter your premises there has to be some rfid card which needs to be scanned which also contributes to your attendance time in time out everything is recorded yes or no yes now that's exactly the same thing which can be implemented here with this code verification the signatures are matched if matched then the component considered to be untampered if there is some malicious component with the same name same version but the key definitely will be different because we might have kept our key safely, right? It, it will not be leaked. In that case, the malicious component will not be accepted by the application. It will say this is not the component I'm looking for. Though the name and version is same, it's not the component that I am looking for. Understand? Yes. Yes. One more example in our day to day life. You go for purchasing some diamonds. Whether it is original or not, how it is certified. So while selling not only diamonds, any precious stone, they give you some certificate, right? Which is. Having some barcode also and using that barcode, the originality is checked. The same thing is now being done with Aadhaar card with your educational mark sheets and certificates also. So that anyone can scan the code and check the validity. Right. Not only validity, but the originality also. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Which avoids the duplication. Correct. Yes. Sir. So that's what code verifier does. But this works if and only if your assembly is a signed assembly. If assembly is not signed, this is optional. I'll put O here. It's O, not zero. OK. Once the code verification is completed. In fact, before this, actually, there is something called as code loader or assembly loader. Let me put that again. I'll just say loader. First, the code is loaded. Then the code verification happens. Right? If code is not loaded in memory, how it will be scanned? That's the point. Once the code verifier says OK, or if it is bypassed in case the signature is missing then the next step is jet compilation which is there in the original diagram here as well yes jet produces yes. the native code which goes to os and side by side, there is a process which keeps track of the unused objects. And clears them when required. Who does that garbage collector? This is the whole process. And then. The code which goes through all this cycle. Is what we call as. Managed. Code.
code right the code which bypasses this process let's say there is some code written in c++ directly natively compiled and here itself i'm getting the native code not il this code will bypass the whole process and this native code will then be merged with this and submitted to os for execution this code which bypasses the clr process is what we call as unmanaged code do you get it yes what yes. is managed code what is unmanaged code managed code is the code managed by clr unmanaged code is the code that is not managed by clr simple terms understood yes any resources which are created and used directly by managed code will be called as managed resources any resources resources means variables objects constants etc that are created by unmanaged code but used by managed code or unmanaged code both those will be called as unmanaged resources now why i actually got this here in this discussion because the gc works or rather takes care of only managed resources gc doesn't take care of unmanaged resources so unmanaged resources needs to be cleaned up explicitly by you by having some disposal mechanism coded explicitly do you get it yes so disposal mechanism means what most likely you will have finalizers in the form of destructors or dot net brings in a disposal pattern also by introducing i disposable interface which forces you to write a method called as dispose whose job is to dispose your object dispose object means delete the memory allotted to it is that clear yes yes okay so this is what we call as execution of dot net application or simply dot net application execution cycle whichever type of dot net application it is desktop based thick client web based thin client mobile client device client or whatever understood yes interesting isn't it yes 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 so i hope this is clear you can take a snapshot of the screen and make your notes later on done one more diagram for the same i have here it's it's actually the same thing much more clearer you can take a snapshot of this as well though the expanded view of uh, what clr does is not there that you can get from what i 
uh, drew on the screen. But yeah, rest of the things are pretty clear. What is managed code? What is unmanaged code? Or and all. Here is managed code. Here is unmanaged thing. Done. Yes. Yeah, I got one more, which is even more clear. Which almost has got everything which I drew as well. Only missing thing is managed and unmanaged code. Uh, but if you have understood the concept, you can easily understand what managed code will be, whatever goes through the CLR cycle or whatever is managed by CLR is managed code. Right? Directly executed by OS, then it is unmanaged one. Correct? Yeah. Take a snapshot of this as well. Done? Yes. OK, now let's talk a bit about assembly. What is assembly and why it is called as assembly? Let me clear the screen. In general, if I ask what is assembly? That is easily answerable, right? What is it? Physical compilation unit in .NET is assembly, which could be either a .exe file or a dot dll file depending on type of application yes if it's a reusable component it will be dll if it is self executable one it will be exe web applications will always be dll got it Yes. What it holds. One component we already discussed. That it holds. MSIL or CIL along with metadata. Let's concentrate only on MSIL or CIL for now. Yes. The intermediate language code, correct? Yes. We have seen this. Then it contains metadata also.
which is also called as type metadata. Make a note. This metadata is also called as type metadata. Type means something about types that you define in your application, data types, which might be classes, interfaces, delegates, structures, enums, etc. Understood? Yes. Yes. And their members like functions, properties, data members, anything. Then there is another type of metadata that you will find here. Something what we call as assembly metadata. Which is also called as manifest for avoiding the confusion. Assembly metadata is the other term for manifest. What this contains? If I say manifest, what it contain? Name of the assembly. That's the first thing. Second, it contains version of the assembly. OK, third it contains. Signature. This is optional. O in bracket means optional. Fourth, it contains the same information. Of other assemblies. on which it depends. It itself depends. Understood? Any questions here? No. Metadata, I hope everyone understood. Yes. Then there is yeah. optional. Part of the assembly, which is what we call as. Resources. What are resources? These days you must have seen most of the applications. Your mobile apps also give you the choice of the language within which you want your applications UI to be rendered. Localized language or global English language, whatever. Yes or no? Yes. Regardless of type of application, you have this choice for most of the applications, correct? So does that right. mean I have so many versions of the applications created separately? I mean the code base no. for all of them is different. No. No. Code is same. Application is same. Compiled once only. Just that we maintain dictionaries that contain the translation from US English to. Rather saying translation, it just contains dictionaries of different languages where we have some tokens that we configure within the application and based on which language version has been selected, the to uh, token value of that language is read. Right? Like there could be a button titled as save in US English. 
बट हिंदी इफ वी कंसिडर इट माइट हैव सुरक्षित करें इन सम अदर लैंग्वेज इट कुड बी सम अदर इक्विवेलेंट राइट राइट नाउ वॉट वी कैन से इज सेव बटन टोकन और सेव बटन लेबल कुड बी द टोकन now whichever dictionary we have selected whatever value is associated with it whether it is save or surakshit kare it will be selected and rendered as the caption of the button or label of the button right right now is it mandatory that we need to have the dictionaries always all the time no in case if we have decided that my application will be english only then probably i don't need any dictionary i'll directly put the values in the ui instead of mapping them to some dictionary tokens right yes that's why the resources are optional resources are nothing but dictionaries of various languages understood which have a yeah. simple requirement that none of the value of any of the ui component should be hard coded rather it should be tokenized and the token value should be assigned so that whenever you install a language pack and you install a language pack means you install the assembly containing that particular resource of that language and then you apply that to your application as the default language so automatically the token value of that language will be rendered correct correct so i hope everyone understands why resources are optional yeah yes understood okay now see this one single component called as assembly the dot exe or the dot dll file contains these four things into one single unit can we say this is assembly of these things yes and that's why in fact it is one of the reason it is called as assembly another reason is if we consider the il language whether it is msil or cil whatever you call it it is near to assembly language in terms of syntaxes and features mainly syntaxes right that's why also this physical compilation unit is called as assembly understood yes yes great take a snapshot of the screen if you have already not noted down the things you can make your notes afterwards thank you can you like explain again that why they all are like combined called as assembly sorry come again like can you explain again that uh, why that uh, all the combination are called as assembly say assembly dictionary meaning if i talk about what it is uh within your office premises i mean outside the building there might be some boards uh having the title as assembly point and uh, some people icon must be there on it so that is in case of any uh, untoward incident happening like if there is an earthquake or if there is a fire incident people have to vacate the building and assemble at one point right 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 now with that if we consider the meaning of assembly what does it mean collection of some objects yes or no yes yes 
now can you understand this yes 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 basically your single file has got four things into it minimum four things now can i say it. this is actually assembly of these four things yes and that's why typically we term this component as assembly usually when we say component component will be only code am i right yes sir here it is not only code along with code there are three other things also that's why it is called as assembly assembly what it what it Anybody else having any other question? I hope the snapshot has been taken. OK, so let's move on. Next is JIT compiler. We need to understand the same. What are the types of JIT compilers we have discussed? Standard JIT. Econo JIT, which is used in very special cases. Third is rejit. Correct. To understand the functionality. Let's focus on this pseudo code which I'm going to write here. Not containing some logic as it just such structure. Suppose you have a program that has got an entry point titled as main. Within which you have some code to start with, simple statements, variable declarations, assignment statements, etc. Right? Then you have a function called as A, which has got some code into it. Then you have got a function called as B. which has got some code into it. This B is being called over here. Couple of lines of code more and function A ends. This function A is being called here. As well. Then some code standard simple lines of code continues over here. Then Directly I call function B here. Some more code. I call function A once more. Some more code. And main function finishes. And apart from main A and B. I have another function called as C. Which has got some code of its own. Just understand the flow. By quickly going through it. Then we'll discuss the functioning of standard JIT first. Done. Yes. Yes. Now usually this code is loaded into the memory first after code verification is completed. It is approved also, right? So here in memory, wherever the code is loaded is something what we call as code cache. Or in general, with respect to memory, it is also called as code segment. .NET calls it as code cache.
where it holds the code. So when we say run the executable for the application, it is the main which is important to start with, right? Main function. Yes or no? So the code for main only is compiled and loaded here. Native code. So basically, standard JIT is used by the CLR. The main is compiled and put into the code cache in native format. And it starts executing here directly. Executing here. So line one executes, line two executes, line three executes. Being simple statements, directly they execute. Variable declarations, assignment, everything happens directly. Then there is a call to function A that is being detected here. Correct? It checks. Do we have A in code cache? Can you tell me? The state of code cache currently is having only? Main. 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 We don't have A. So can I start the execution of A directly? If it is not loaded, I cannot. Yes or no? Yes. Then it goes to function A, loads it, compiles it to native code and puts it over here. Okay and starts executing function a one two three being the same simple statements executed directly then there is a call to b being detected same behavior once again do we have b here no so what happens b is compiled and loaded in core cache Right and starts executing one, two, three. And return. After returning only simple statements are there. This is also executed. And A also returns. Where it was called in main. Simple statements to follow. So they are executed. Call to B. Do we have B here now? Yes. Do we need to recompile it? No. no. There is a copy already present, right? Something what we call as binary code reusability feature is there. As the code already is present, direct execution starts here. Okay. Returns to main. Next two statements are executed. Then the call to A. Do we have A already here? Yes. Yes. So second execution of A starts here. Call to B. Do we have B here? Yes. Reused. Third execution of B starts here. Right? Return. Right. And the remaining two statements of A are finished. Returns to main. And remaining three statements are executed and finished got it and once yes. the entire program is finished all the stuff from here is deleted your code cache becomes clean once more because your program itself is finished right there is nothing more to execute so i don't require this code to be there in the memory anymore yes or no yes, yes removed this is how main or uh, this is how the standard jit compiler works and this is default compiler as well understood i'll put d over here d for default you don't need to do anything to use standard jit at all is it clear yes Yes. 
let me clean this up. This is where we started, right? Just D I'll put again here for default. Now let's understand how Econojet works. Econojet, initial functioning is quite similar to standard JIT only. We need main to be invoked because this is entry point. We don't have main and code cache, so compile, add it to the code cache, starts executing. Statement one, two, three. Fourth is call to A. A is not present in code cache. So compile added here. Right? Starts executing. One, two, three. Fourth is call to B. B is not there. So compile added in code cache and starts executing. One, two, three. Return. On return, this B is deleted immediately. B is deleted immediately. This is where the first difference comes in compared to standard JIT. Standard JIT was not deleting. Standard JIT deleted the code only at the end of the program. Am I right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Here, upon return only, the function is getting removed from code cache. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is this clear? Yes. So B returns where where it was invoked. The remaining two statements are completed and A also returns. What happens at this moment? A is also removed. Only main is present because it is still executing. Next three statements executed call to B is detected looking at the current state i don't have b anymore here so b is recompiled and added here and then the second time execution starts returns upon return again it gets deleted and then the main function continues next is called to a Again, current state says A is no more there. Compiled again, added over here in the code cache. Second time execution for A starts here. Call to B. B is not there, so B is again compiled and added here. And then third time execution for B starts. It returns. Upon return, B is deleted. And then A continues with the remaining statements being executed and returns. Upon return, A once again is deleted. And then it continues main. So at this moment, only main is there, right? Once this is also complete, main is also removed. But see, the main difference you can see here, every time some function is required, it's getting compiled at that moment. Performance wise, this is a little slow, but sometimes actually we need this behavior. And hence we have the choice of Econojet as well. Do you get it? Yes. Do you get the difference between standard and Econojet? Yes. Now tell me when should I go for standard jet? When should I go for EconoJet? I mean, with respect to type of applications, you can tell me. One common thing in both C is never touched. C never got into code cache, correct? Yes. 
only required code in the current flow is getting added to the code cache. Keeping the memory footprint of your application as low as possible. Only the required things being loaded. Make sense or not? Quite optimized. Use cases, if I'm having a typical standard thick client application running on the desktop, I will prefer standard JIT and that's why it is default for thick client desktop applications. But if I'm working on devices, smart devices, mobile devices, tabs, which have limited resources compared to a complete computer system. No matter how powerful they are, still they will be very, very lagging compared to a proper computer system, right? Right. Means I will always have limited amount of resources available on a device other than a computer system. Yes or no? Yes. So don't you think I should be carefully maintaining the size of code cache? As soon as my work is over, I should release the memory occupied so that the same memory can be utilized for something else. That's why upon return, the function is getting deleted all the time. Yes or no? Yes. Though the overall performance in this case will degrade a bit, reason every time recompilation is required, but then we cannot expect high performance from a device based application all the time. It will always be a low performing application compared to a proper computer system. Yes or no? Yes. So if I am having a mobile application or device application, I will have Econojet as default. I don't need to do anything. I just need to see which type of application I have created. Have I chosen the correct type of application or not? That's what I need to see. Is it clear? Yes. Right. Then comes the third one. Let me clean up these. I'll put D here as well. D for mobiles, default for mobiles or device applications, right? Yes. Now, what is pre JIT? Pre means before. So, practically, what happens here is the entire code is compiled to native code. Even before we start executing the application. And a physical file holds that native code into it. Dot exe. Or dot dll is created, which then contains the native code. For this. We use a pre-JIT compiler as a tool. The tool is something what we call as engine.exe. This you have to run on your .exe or .dll. It will produce the physical file .exe or .dll based on the input, and the output of this file will be having native code only into it. This is also called as native assembly. It will be assembly only, but native. It won't have IL code. It will have native code. The rest of the things will be just like assembly. Did you get it? Yeah. Yes. Right. So project 
is used explicitly by using the tool engine.exe. Understood? How it functions? Already native code is there. So code cache will directly load the entire native code when we say execute. So it will have main already into it, A already into it, B already into it, even C also, whether being used or not, regardless of that fact, C will also be loaded. Everything in ready to run condition. Okay. And then the execution starts. The execution flow will be just like what it was there before for standard jet econo jet. Just that now the compilation will not be required even for the first time because it's already compiled and put into code cache. Simply copy of native code from the native assembly is being loaded directly into your code cache. Because you have everything in code cache already. No need of compilation at the moment when execution happening. Right. Right. Now tell me when prejet will be used. Any server application will require prejet. Because when uh, we say yeah. server application, server application probably doesn't have any idea which user will place the request for which functionality. It can be anything requested by anyone at any time, right? Right. That's why I need to keep everything in ready condition. What's my point? Yes. Sir. OK, so. That's where prejet compilation is used. So whether it is a web service, web app, web API or any service oriented architecture based application which is serving something to its clients. Those application assemblies will be prejet compiled. By using this tool. Got it. Yes. Yes, yes. OK, take the snapshot of this also. So that we can move to the last topic. Done. Let me clean this up. And now let's talk about GC. GC stands for garbage. Collect. Collector. After uh, attribution of the main class, uh, it get where uh, the primary get vanish or like it will be there. Uh, sorry, for come again. For praise date, uh, like after execution of the main, uh, then uh, memory you will be the there program or like finished. It? After that, it will be removed from the code cache. But the physical file okay. still will have the native code, right? So okay, next okay, time again, yeah. just the copy needs to be created. OK, OK, so no runtime compilation required. That makes the performance faster. Got it? Yes, sir. OK, so garbage collector. 
very simple example i have got here uh the household example only i'll take how you dispose of your garbage from your house if you are staying in an apartment what is the process in 24 hours there might be a lot of waste generated in the house right of different forms different kinds it could be vegetable waste fruit waste it could be food waste it could be just general waste also right dust and all that yes or no yes yes maybe some packaging uh, which came with some parcel that also becomes waste after opening correct so whenever correct. the waste is generated do you call someone to collect it immediately no 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 you put that somewhere in dustbin or equivalent right yes you keep on collecting for 24 hours every day at one specific time the collectors basically come to your door and get all the garbage generated till that time with them they dump that garbage from your bin to a bigger bin which they carry with them yes or no yes yes why bigger bin because they need to probably go to multiple uh, apartments in the building on different floors so they carry a bigger bin correct but is that bin infinite no that also needs to be emptied somewhere right yes so most likely that bin gets emptied once it is full into your corporation garbage uh, collection truck correct correct and they carry to a bigger dump yard somewhere far away from the city yes yes sir what happens there that's not our interest as of now we just need to understand the process readily generating waste we are collecting in a small bin once in a while in fact in day to day life once in a day it goes to a bigger bin from where it goes to even bigger bin which is kind of infinite not actually infinite but yeah contains lot of space yes or no yes sir your garbage collector here in dotnet works exactly the same way there are three stages of garbage collection which are called as three generations of the garbage collector through which your variables pass Okay. Now suppose you say object A, where this goes. This is your generation zero. This is generation one. This is generation two. All objects, new created objects, go in generation zero by default. So A gets loaded here. You say object B, somewhere within the flow. B also gets loaded here. Object C in the same flow gets loaded here. There will be a time when this space will no more be available. Or the objects cannot be accommodated over here. Yes or no? It's a pretty small space, right. just like your uh, dustbin in your home. OK? And over the time, some of these objects become unusable as well. Yes or no? 
Yes, sir. Let's say this is the object which becomes unusable after some time. Object B, which is not being used by any variable within the program flow, just there in the memory. So this needs to be removed. Yes or no? A and C are still active, but the thing is I need generation zero to be emptied so that more objects can be accommodated in generation zero. But A and C should not be completely removed as well. So what happens? The garbage collection happens on generation zero at this moment. Your objects A and C are promoted to generation one. So here I have A and C already. B is removed and your generation zero becomes empty. This was generation zero garbage collection. Do you understand? Yes. Now I say there is another object D. Object E. Object F added where they will be added. D E F. In this, let's say D becomes unusable. E and F are still being referred. And generation zero garbage collection happens here. OK. At this moment, I find object A has also become unusable. So object A is deleted. Object D is deleted here. E and F are transferred or promoted to generation one. And removed from here. Means once again your generation zero is. Empty and ready to accept new objects. Here also. I'll say this is just marked for deletion. Now more objects are added. Object. G. Object H. Object I. Object J. All these will be added here. G, H, I, J. Now suppose couple of these objects are so big that they have occupied whole generation zero. And then there is another object being added. Object K, where it will be accommodated. So garbage collection needs to happen here. Correct. Correct. Means these will all be promoted. Correct. G, H, I, J. Till here. This will all be removed. And K will be added here. There is another object being created L. Which is also as big as K and both these objects require entire generation zero. What will happen? K needs to be promoted, but it's so big that generation one also don't have space enough for accommodating K alone. So generation one garbage collection also happens here. Let's say by this time F is marked for deletion means it's not being used. And maybe C is also not being used. All used objects will be promoted to generation two. So I have E, I have G, H, I, J. And the generation one will be cleaned up. The objects marked for deletion will be actually deleted. And K then will be promoted to generation one. Making room for L. L will be allotted here. This keeps on happening. Generation two garbage collection happens when 
generation two has got no more room to accommodate more objects. So what happens is, let's say when generation two collection happens, it finds that these are the two objects which are marked for deletion. They are actually removed and the space allocated to them is reclaimed, <coughs> which can be then allotted to other objects. This is a cycle which keeps on repeating. Understood? Yes. This is how garbage collector works. Now I'm just putting the name of a book into your chat window. By any chance, if you get the access to it, it should be available online as well in PDF format. Where you will find all the details of whatever we have discussed so far, including the garbage collection functionality in detail. Please go for it. CLR with C sharp is the name of the book. Search for it. Maybe you can search for it within your library as well. If you have digital library using SharePoint there also, you can check it. If not, Google can help you out. Please go through it, which will make you understand the entire .NET Framework core architecture in detail. It is based on whatever we have discussed. My discussion or my explanation was based on the contents of this book only, but still in detail, if you want to learn few things, if you want to have a complete deep dive into it, please go through this book. That will enhance your understanding and allows you to write the .NET code, which is very much optimized. Got it? Yes, sir. OK, search for it and if someone gets a PDF, please do share with with everyone. Maybe in this chat also you can share so that everyone has the access to it. OK. So go and revise yes, everything. We have uh, almost one and a half day before we resume our session. So in fact, more than one and a half day. Just give some time to it. Not more than one hour will be required in total. So just go through it, revise everything. See if you have any further doubts. We will take that up first before we start the session day after tomorrow. OK, so that is it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for attending the session. Thanks for giving the time as well. See you on Tuesday uh, on, on Wednesday 9.30 a.m. IST. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I hope you have thank liked you. the session. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, because it was just the first session. Thank you. Had to be thank more you. discussion, more explanation, more theoretical thank concepts. You. Slowly we'll be starting with hands on and once we pick up the pace with hands on, the session will be more hands on only. OK. Oh, oh, correct. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Saket. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. See you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank team, you. Uh, thank team, you. Just a minute, please do not log off. Uh, I wanted to uh, tell you that I have shared the details of the tickets raised for your installation. Uh, kindly follow up with the ITIM team. Visual Basic, um, uh, one of them is the licensed version. Uh, which needs approval uh, from uh, someone that ITIM will uh, let you know. But the other tools that I have shared, uh, there are three, four other tools uh, like the frameworks and the database. Uh, those are all free and uh, that are already uh, approved by my manager. So you are um, you are free to connect with ITIM and please install it as soon as possible. Check the service ID that I have shared over the mail uh, and Go through the TOC as well that I have shared. All right. Hope you, all of you have received that mail. If not, please let me know. Ping me. I am there. I'll share those uh, details again. Oh. Anketa Saket here. Just have one. Yes, Saket, please. Uh, if we have uh, the option of uh, community edition being used, uh, licensing will not be uh, required in that case. Uh, so we can go for Visual Studio community also. 
Okay, Saket, I'll let the ITIM team know. Uh, yeah. They have mentioned, like, uh, I, I really do not have the idea of... Uh, yeah, which I, is I can tell you, like, Visual Studio Enterprise or Visual Studio Professional will require licenses, which will okay. require the approvals. Community okay. Edition, if we install on... Uh, that doesn't need any licenses and that can be used for learning purposes without any problem officially. Okay. All right. Uh, could you please drop in the chat box, Saket? It will be helpful for me to connect with yeah, IKM. Sure. And sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much. That's all from my side. Folks, you all have a wonderful session, I feel. Uh, be prepared for the next session uh, with Saket on Wednesday. And please, please, please log in before 5 to 10 minutes ago. Prior to 5 to 10 minutes, 9.30. We should not make Saket wait from the next session onwards. Ankita, okay. I've put that into the chat. You can Thank you it. so much. Thank you so much, Saket. Thank I have you. got it. Good day, guys. Good day, Saket. Thanks for the wonderful session. Thanks, thanks. Meet you on Wednesday. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Vikas, are you there? 